The Strategy of Information with Nick Inglis on infogov.net. On today's The Strategy of Information, Nick Inglis talks with Rich Lowers. Rich Lowers has been a leader in the information space for some time with previous roles at Granger, Abbott Labs, CDW, Pacific Life, Merrill Corp, Newix, Microfocus, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Biogen, Zurich, and most recently AO Docs. Lowers is a wellspring of knowledge and has been spearheading some of the most innovative strategies around information today. Stay tuned for direct answers to tough questions, and the wealth of experience of Rich Lowers on today's episode of The Strategy of Information with Nick Inglis, on infogov.net. Content services. It's one of the terms that definitely earns points on buzzword bingo cards. But that doesn't mean that the underlying concept isn't one of the most revolutionary concepts to hit the information space. Setting aside all of the marketing hype, what exactly is content services? What it is, is it's a decoupling of functionality from platform, making functionality portable across multiple information platforms, essentially whatever platforms you're using. And one of the early leaders in that space, an early trailblazer, has been AO Docs, built on top of the Google ecosystem. And one of the first influential people to join the AO Docs team and recognize that opportunity is my good friend, Rich Lowers. I'm very excited to welcome Rich Lowers to the strategy of information. We're gonna talk a little bit about history, a bit about his career, uh, also about content services and what Rich has been up to at AO Docs. I am very proud to welcome to the Strategy of Information, Rich Lowers. Hey, Rich. Welcome to the Strategy of Information. Uh, I'm so glad you're here with Happy me. Happy Friday. I'm very glad to be here also. Indeed. Rich, you are a friend, admittedly, and one of the folks in my, my contact list for whenever I get stuck on something. <laughs> so if there's something that I don't know, you're one of the people that I pick up the phone and call. So that's how I position you is like, Mr. Fix it for me and information. That's a compliment. Thank but you. I'll take it. <laughs> you, you probably have some better positioning for yourself. How do you position yourself to clients and customers and prospects and the like? I, I help uh, people or organizations know what they have, where they have it, and what they're required or what they want to do with it. That's information governance. That's what I do for a living. It's brilliant. So, and, and I've gotten to know you through speaking and presenting at various information related conferences. You're always straightforward, right to the point, comfortable with anything. Um, let's, let's talk about your day job. You are uh, currently with AO Docs. Um, What's your current role? What's a typical day look like? Typical you? day is probably about 60% of it is in front of a, either potential customers or existing customers, helping them really translate their business challenges with you know content or document management into a solution that can help them not only do what they want to do, but still maintain uh, their their compliance profile or, or at least comp you know, maintain their, their adherence to their own policies. And the other uh, half of the time, it really is assisting my product management team in understanding those customer challenges and translating that into the amazing things that technical platforms can do and that, that our, our platform in particular can do. And what, what exactly, give me the rundown on AO Docs. What exactly uh, is AO Docs? Yeah. Uh, oh, we're not known very much at all <laughs> for that matter, but truly uh, the reason why I joined AO Docs is because um, when I found a, a content services platform that was born in the cloud, that was 100% cloud-based, I found very quickly that many of the barriers or, or guardrails that I had had in many other engagements and many other roles were gone. And, and that, that as a cloud-born organization, they thought of things very differently as far as uh, both agility and being able to do something quickly, but also in the ability of, what can't they do? They, they couldn't think of anything that they couldn't do or shouldn't do. And that has led to, you know, astounding developments in products specifically for life sciences, you know, which is, you know, a significant challenge, but also more recently in financial services, both of which are 
very, very difficult information governance challenges, let alone regulatory and compliance challenges. And um, that that's kind of uh, why I joined them because of that, that it really opened up a lot of possibilities. And truly from a former boxes and wires guy, you know, it, it, it broke me out personally. And it has been not only uh, helped me develop myself from a, from a understanding these, these cloud concepts better, but really now given me many more tools to be able to solve problems in a uniquely different way, utilizing, you know, machines to actually solve machine-based issues. You know, it's, it's been very interesting. Yeah. And, and, you know, folks that are tuning in, they, they may have seen you at one of these information conferences that uh, I've, I've gotten to know you well at. You're, you're really well known in the profession. Um, most folks know where you are today, but let's take it back. Where, where did you start your career? How did you get into this crazy information profession? You know, uh, I started as a boxes and wires IT guy. I was just, you know, helping uh, helping build computers, helping put them in, you know, computer rooms, uh, refrigerated closets, whatever that may be. And it really wasn't until um, for a Y2K project, they ran out of project managers and they looked to IT for somebody who can engage with the business to help remediate an issue or whatever that may be, right? And they assigned me to work with the general counsel of the company I was at at the time. That was Granger up here in, in, in Chicago. And uh, I suddenly became the IT guy who felt comfortable talking to lawyers, you know, and through the good graces of the United States Congress, and SOX controls and HIPAA and every regulatory issue you could think of, IT is a major enabler of organizations being able to meet those obligations. I became that IT guy and through various stints in highly regulated industries, whether it's biopharmaceutical here in, in, in Chicago or whether it was a financial services company in, in Orange County, California, gave me a tremendous amount of experience in helping use technology to really um, give an organization the opportunity to meet their obligations. So you started on the tactical side, but I know you now on the strategic side. How, how do you think that transition happens in your career where it was, <clears throat> you know, nuts and bolts configuration through to big picture? You know, uh, I think when, when I was first asked to use my technology skills to help solve a, a legal or a regulatory question, the first thing I did is I found out somebody who was either a significant stakeholder or responsible. That was the records manager at the company I was at. And, and truly, she enabled me to not only understand, you know, the, the nature of the obligations that the organization had for books and records, let alone for information, right? At the time, this was probably uh, closer to 2000, 2002, right? and uh, encouraged me to become a member of the various of the organizations that are out there, right, for us as professions. And I found very quickly that they were talking a language I had no idea about. But I also found very quickly that it was, an org that it was a language of boxes and microfiche and of, of really things that were foreign to me from being an electronic professional at that time. And uh, I, I got very closely into the technology aspects of how those things were growing at the time, everything from, you know, advanced scanners that could read barcodes automatically to, you know, being able to um, talk about things as complex as litigation events or regulatory events that required the production of data. And in that time, electronic data, which had suddenly became a significant burden. Yeah. And that, that really is, is that was the transition. New. Yeah, yeah, that was new. And I, you know, I, I give a lot of credit actually to, um, Cheryl McKinnon, somebody who we both know, who let me know yeah. about a, a, a certificate that, a, that one of those organizations was going to do a CIP. And we, uh, uh, we had a challenge saying, you know, who could pass it without studying? Who could pass it without knowing what even was going to be in it? And so me and several of colleagues that you and I both know went and did yeah. it that February when it came out. And, you know, they compared numbers to see who passed with the higher number. And I, I've, I've maintained <laughs> that certification. And thanks to Jesse Wilkins, yeah. also a friend of ours, uh, he, uh, I have uh, continued to try to really push that that you know electronic as a medium is should be the primary concern, and luckily that happened, and 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 you know I'm suddenly yeah. you know looked at as somebody who knows what the hell I'm talking about, and now and now it's all come together. So if you're looking back towards those earlier years of your profession, 
what's one thing you wish you had known or someone had told you, like, don't go into information or no. no you know, <laughs> something. Um, so I used to be that guy who said, oh, hang on a second. You, you need to manage your information. Let's give you a folder to put your stuff in, right? Let's make you do the job that I'm supposed to help you with by giving you folders and, and self-service. I would tell that guy to not let humans do the work that machines can do, to truly provide more automation, more capabilities, and do more work on the front end of forcing a business to advance their, their, their basic knowledge of their own data to be able to classify and categorize their content as a part of its creation, as a part of its early life cycle, not you know following behind the elephant and cleaning up afterwards with a bunch of folders, because that dump and run effect of people just you know throwing stuff was never fruitful. It it, it was four years yeah. wasted helping people you know put together retention schedules in a bunch of Outlook folders. Yeah, but that was what everyone was doing at that time as well. So it's not as though you were an outlier in doing that in any way, shape, or form. It's just that our tech wasn't there. No, very true, very true. I mean, I, I'm not going to fault you on that one. Um, what, what advice would you give to somebody who is uh, tuning in today and is just, uh, just entering the information profession? Maybe they Googled... Don't, what is uh, what is information they ended up here? Don't, don't okay. enter the don't. information profession. <laughs> Truly, as a standalone profession, there's a lot of niche services. Do the business work that you like to do. Do the things that you enjoy uh, because the technology and the information requirements around that are already there. They're already a foundational yeah. requirement of every job you could think of. Lawyer even today. Lawyers have tremendous obligations to learn about technology before. That used to be the place where people would go so they could avoid having to learn about technology, you know? So I, yeah. I would say that truly <laughs> not anymore. being the tip of the spear and saying, you know, I want to learn technology. If you're a math whiz and, and you're going to, you know, get a PhD and, you know, advanced mathematics, great. That's the, the right way. But truly as an ancillary skill set to everything else that's being done, I think that's really kind of the, the, the more appropriate route or really what's happening to most folks. No, that's great advice. And, you know, you stay at the forefront of, the profession at all times. So if there's, you know, as there are new advances, I know that you're someone who knows those things, like just innately. How how do you stay up with your knowledge? Like what are the practices that you keep for yourself to stay on top of all of the things that are well, happening? I'm gonna I'm gonna give the very learned answer saying, oh, it's the stack of books next <laughs> to my bed. No. Nah, you know, there was a time where we're trying to really stay abreast of the reading materials that were published. That was the way to go. But truly today, it's been experiences. It's been trying things. It's been yeah. using opportunities of challenges to try and solve them differently and truly using our peer network. And you and I both, you know, you know, yeah. know that sometimes a call to a friend can give you a tremendous amount of insight. I mean, we have we have colleagues who are in this industry that if we were to add all of their experiences together, we would have hundreds of years of experience, right. you know, whether it's Alan on, on teaching me a little bit more about RPA and AI or whether it's Steve Weissman, you know, telling me about, hey, there's, here's some things that, you know, have been done that work. Use these as solid foundational practices. Don't don't try and, you know, shoot for the moon the first try. These are the voices that truly influence not only how I apply the technology that I learned today, but how I make sure that my customers know how to do these foundational things before I try to, you know, have them hit the moon. Yeah, that that's a great answer. And it it is a lot of learning through the peer networks of late. It seems to be the where where the knowledge is. It's who I zoom with once a week. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. And you find your network. You find your peer network that supports you and is knowledgeable and you build that over time. Um this profession is constantly changing with new technologies coming. I mean, at times it feels like it's every week there's some new acronym that uh, some service provider has created that is going to revolutionize everything. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But what are some of the things that you're currently watching or are intrigued by? You know, I, I, I want to say it is um, those platforms that haven't been already bought by somebody else that are starting to really grow in, in, into into niches. You know, I want to say it's the you know competitors for e-signatures, right? Who are who are 
doing it as a service, not as a $12 a signature charge, right? Who are looking at it more, more holistically and as a microservice, not as a, you know, foundation for building an entire, you know, engine to get money from lawyers. You know, I, I think, I think those are the things that I'm paying attention to. The other thing I'm really kind of paying attention to is how the evolution of those areas of the business that are getting funding is security is a really good example. You know, as more and more money is going to security and organizations trying to uh, meet their data privacy obligations, some of those technologies are going to bleed into our profession, just like eDiscovery helped us with categorization and classification. Those technologies will help us with doing other things. And, and that's really where I go because nobody spends money to do IG, right? Nobody spends money to do uh, records management. What they spend money on are the things that we happen to maybe cherry pick those things from hopefully, you know, best in class, best in services. But in some cases, you know, just kind of getting whatever's left over as far as being able to kind of utilize a thing to do something else. You know, it's uh, anti-money laundering technologies or behavioral evaluation of communication technologies. You know, we're using those to get, and not for sentiment analysis on forms, but for sentiment analysis to see which one's the right form, which one's the one I need to, you know, keep as a record because it's the one everybody goes to, not the other five that were theoretically official, yeah. right? Those types of ancillary things as far as our profession goes, but really, things that we can bring in and, and, you know, add to our like Swiss army knife of, you know, technologies we steal and apply for our profession. Yeah, Swiss army knife. I like that. Cause we, we do, we find these technologies that are outside of the IG, the information management space and apply them, whether it's workflow engines or form. RPA is a good example. Yeah, <laughs> you know, nobody exactly. uses it for IG, but it's a great way for us to be able to kind of help organizations do things a little bit better, especially when it comes to managing content. Yeah. So before the pandemic hit, AO Docs was in explosive growth uh, category. They were, you know, flying uh, high. Uh, Early in 2020, there was a press release that went out that said you guys had uh, over 80% year-over-year growth, which that blew my mind at, at that time. And then the pandemic hit, and, you know, what was the secret to the success? And have you guys been able to maintain it through the pandemic? Is it more or less, is it going back to where it it's going. I, I know that's a lot. To no, no. So, so realistically, <laughs> there was just like every organization that lag, right? And that in that first, you know, first quarter of of 2020, where everybody was like, okay, what's going to happen? And then as as things kind of, you know, understood what the scope and scale of the impact would be, cloud based applications suddenly became the first thing. Every every decision somebody deferred now had to be urgently made. And and going through three different VPNs to get to my, you know, 15 year old file net system suddenly was no longer feasible. Right. And we found yeah. that many of those types of customers who were on the edge or and not cloud first suddenly became cloud first. And then we also found that the customers that we had had to accelerate their, their implementation and start to use it for, for uh, very, very um, uh, innovative kind of solutions. And we also found lots and lots of new customers who were just coming in to try and do one or two things that they had to do that was cloud enabled. A good example is we actually released a, a COVID awareness app that, that we released as free. And it was really just for white collar companies suddenly having to reach out to people at home saying, hey, do you have everything you need? Are you okay? Uh, because there is an OSHA requirement for making sure that your workplace is safe. And suddenly white collar companies who never worried about that suddenly yeah. thought, oh, you know, shit, I have to keep track of how everybody's doing in these places I, I don't touch. And if they come back into the office, show the documentation trail that said, I asked if you were okay, you said you were okay. Yeah. Not only did you assert you were okay, I you. Uh, you, <laughs> you know, I gave you the opportunity to you know, take advantage of whatever services we had to protect you. you know, it became those types of things. And the other thing was that what I found very, very quickly was that everything that was previously off or out of bounds for organizations suddenly became, you know, something people could use. Slack is a really good example. People just who yeah. had said, no, we turned off Slack. We're not going to let people use it. Suddenly, even highly regulated organizations were using it. And now we're trying yeah. to clean up behind that elephant, trying to figure out, okay, how do I yeah. preserve all those things? I have an obligation to preserve and, 
we're assisting many of those customers in trying to do those things too. Yeah, it, COVID shifted a lot of our conversations uh, it, across the profession. And it, there's, there has been an extreme acceleration, especially in cloud technologies or things that would enable people to work from home. What have you seen change for, for your day to day? Uh, for me, I mean, I'm uh, sorry about that. For me, nothing. <laughs> that. Yeah. Well, really, yeah, exactly. Working with my dog. Uh, the other thing that I think that has significantly changed has been this. You and I talk yeah. now and I wave at you on a camera. You know, that's a, it's a very unique change. Yeah. Where, where can our, our viewers and listeners connect with you online, Rich? Where, where should we send them? <laughs> don't, don't look at my Twitter, whatever you do. But no, uh, uh, <laughs> well, nor Rich Lowers on, on Twitter, you know, is, is in my, my personality in addition to my, you know, industry insightfulness and obviously on LinkedIn. Brilliant. Rich Lowers, he's the legal and regulatory solutions subject matter expert at AO Docs. Rich. Thank you for joining me on the strategy. Oh, good time. Winnie says hello, too. <laughs> <laughs> she certainly does. Bye now. We'll, we'll have you back yep. soon. And, and make sure you bring Winnie so that she can get on frame. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, man. Such an interesting conversation with Rich Lowers. Thank you to Rich for joining me for the conversation. And a huge thank you to you for supporting the program by subscribing. You've definitely subscribed to the program already, right? Or by becoming a contributor and making programming like this possible. Learn more about how you can support our program at infogov.net. In our next episode, we'll be talking with George Dunn, president of Create Consultants. That's C-R-E in the number eight consultants and widely recognized guru of business process improvement. George Dunn on the next episode of The Strategy of Information. I'm excited for you to listen in on that episode. Until then, I wish you the absolute best in all of your information endeavors. The Strategy of Information is listener and sponsor supported programming. Subscribing to the podcast is free, but supporters gain access to every episode in HD video, bonus episodes, the occasional extended interview, merch like tote bags and stickers, and so much more. Head to infogov.net to learn more about supporting the program. Corporate sponsorship options are now available for Season 2 of The Strategy of Information. The Strategy of Information with Nick Inglers is available on podcast platforms everywhere and online at infogov.net. This has been a production of infogov.net.